Tonight and every Monday night, Downstairs Entertainment, in association with Davy Boy Productions, presents Rex Riveter, Private Eye. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Rex Riveter, Private Eye, in part three of A Case of Triple Indemnity. My name is Riveter, Rex Riveter, license number 698753, issued by the Police Department of Los Angeles. Occupation, private detective. I'm working an insurance case that has me running all over town. Currently, I'm standing in the Bel Air living room of Carmen Scalati, the hopeful recipient of close to a quarter million dollar policy. She doesn't know yet that I'm the guy that will decide whether she gets the dough. I was trying to get some information from her about her husband's death. Unfortunately, she had other ideas. She pulled a gun. I don't like it when people try to shoot me. I'm funny that way. Let go of me! Well, that didn't go like I planned. Carmen Scalati lay on the floor of her living room, sobbing. She wasn't hit, but there's something about the sight of a woman crying that tears at a man's soul. I couldn't think about that now. The shot was loud enough to wake the dead. Some good Samaritan neighbor would be on the horn to the cops in no time. And now there was a shadow standing where the front door used to be. Why don't you come inside? We weren't expecting anyone, but Carmen here just put on a pot of coffee. Ain't that right, sweetheart? Go to hell! The late afternoon shadows play across the doorway. The figure they hide doesn't move, but I can see a glint of steel. Whoever he is has a pistol drawn and pointed right at my breadbasket. <laughs> Suddenly, a crash from the kitchen tells me Luca, the gardener, has busted in on our little party. Someone's going to make a fortune remodeling this joint. Carmen must pay this guy for more than digging around in her begonias. He's dirty, but well-armed. His bead shifts from me to the figure in the door. His eyes are wild and he's shaking a bit. But the shotgun he's carrying would do the trick on me or the new man in our life. We look like the cover of one of those Pulp Fiction magazines. A nice house. A disheveled dame at my feet and a Roscoe in my hand, barrel still smoking. A crazy-eyed gardener standing in the kitchen. And a shadowy figure in the doorway. All we need now is a catchy title like... Triple Indemnity. It's an insurance job, I told myself not three hours ago. It'll be a cinch. All you have to do is make sure there's nothing funny going on. The wife will get her dough and you can collect your fee for a couple of days of rest and relaxation, I said. If I get out of this alive, remind me to have a stern talk with a voice in my head. Tutto bene, eh, signora Scalati? Sto bene, Luca. Ti prego, non lasciarmi solo con questi uomini. English. Io non ti lascio, ma questi due uomini sono amati. Cosa posso fare? Riesci a vedere uomo vicino alla porta? Say it in English. No. E in piedi all'interno, al buio. Allora spalaghi prima. Shut up, both of you. The place goes quiet, like the calm just before a storm. You can feel the electricity in the air. Building, ready to discharge. I hear a fly buzzing around the large French doors that lead out to the back patio. The gardener's breathing is like a freight train barreling through a sleepy little town at midnight. And all the while, the shadow in the doorway stands quiet, patient as the dead. I don't speak Italian, but everything I need to know I got from the tone of their voices. Luca, the gardener, wants to know who to shoot first, me or the shadowy figure in the doorway. Carmen probably told him to shoot both of us. Or wait until one of us shoots the other and then he could kill that one. 
The details don't matter as much as the fact that it was unlikely any of us would be getting out of here alive. I imagine the inevitable arrival of the boys in blue, a quadruple homicide in Bel Air resulting in four graves and a thousand questions. I'm not quite ready to check out yet, so I'll have to handle this real cool. Well, boys, looks like we got ourselves a Mexican standoff. Spara, Luca. Spara questi bastardi. Uccidli, così potremo uscire de qua. I said can it. Or Farmer Giuseppe will be the first to catch lead, and you'll be number two, doll. And you, in the doorway. Why don't you step inside where I can get a good look at you? I believe I will stay where I am for now, Mr. Riveter. How do you know it? The voice digs at my brain. While the clock on the mantle ticks away precious seconds, each one bringing the cops closer. I wish I knew if that was a good thing or not. As Luca swings the barrel of his shotgun from me to the stranger, it hits me like a ton of bricks. Anthony Salerno. Mr. Riveter, you flatter me. Tony Salerno is a mid-level enforcer for a guy that prefers to stay out of the newspapers. I accidentally did a favor for his boss a few days ago. His appearance here could make things more complicated. He steps out of the shadow, but his pistol stays trained on me. Eh, l'uomo col completo. Ha detto che sarebbe il ritorno. Ed è qui. Cosa devo fare? Zito, idiota. Parla italiano. Lui capisce quello che stai dicendo. Zito, tutti e due. Mamma e papa stanno parlando. Mrs. Scalati and the gardener go silent. That's a neat trick. Can you get him to roll over and fetch too? Mrs. Scalati's gardener is feeling a little anxious about all the guns. He would prefer you put yours down. Of course, we could always kill them. That would be quick. A little messy. Besides, how do I know once I do her? You won't surprise me by adding some lead to my diet. Thus we find ourselves in quite a predicament. He'll do it too. Do not trust him, Mr. Riveter. He's a killer. Care to elaborate? That's the bastardo that murdered my husband. I've got to stop taking these easy cases. Mrs. Scalati, perhaps we could discuss this reasonably. And in private. Carmen Scalati's eyes grow even larger in fear. She looks from Anthony to the gardener and finally to me. Shoot him. Anthony levels his gun on Carmen. Luca aims the shotgun at Anthony, and I aim my 38 at Luca. This is getting us nowhere, and the cops will be here any minute. Finally, Anthony breaks the stalemate. I'm going to lower my weapon. I would very much like you to do the same. Bene, Luca. Sto mettendo via la mia pistola. Non se pericolo qui. I'm not a danger to you or your employer. Luca looks as wild-eyed as ever. The adrenaline is starting to get to him. I can see his hands begin to shake. Cosa devo fare, Carmen? Se spalla l'uomo col completo. Quello con gli aperomorone uccidera me e poi te. Luca points the shotgun at Salerno, who raises his own pistol again and aims it at the gardener. The whole scene would be comical if it weren't so deadly. Off in the distance, I hear a siren. While the two Italians play chicken, I pick Carmen off the floor and then hold her close with her own pistol in her ribs. Her hair smells like vanilla. No! Per favore, non vale di male. Luca shouts out something in Italian and drops the rifle. Anthony Salerno follows his lead. Without guns pointing at me, I have a moment to think. All right, Mr. Riveter. The police will arrive momentarily, and I do not wish to be here when they do. I will take my leave for now. But there are some particulars about this matter that we should discuss. Perhaps we should talk later at the club. Macambos? What kind of sucker do you take me for? Too many unfriendlies there. We can meet at a neutral spot. My office. Your office is not what I would consider neutral. Four o'clock. Take it or leave it. Very well, Mr. Riveter. I will be at your office at four o'clock. And with that, Anthony Salerno leaves. He doesn't seem pleased... But I'll have to worry about that later. Devo uccidere il polizzito. Siento le sirene. Se mi vendono con il fucile, cosa devo fare? Non ancora, Luca. 
Vediamo cosa succederà. All right, cut it out, both of you. You, Luca, hide the shotgun before the cops get here. Carmen, you're going to have to tell them it was an accident. The gun went off, and Luca and I both busted in here afterward. Stick to that story, and we'll all be fine. You got it? Why should I? Because I'm the only thing standing between you and Anthony Salerno. This is Randy Cool, the voice of Rex Riveter. And this is Greg McAfee of Downstairs Entertainment. We are so grateful to all the fans who nominated me. And the rest of the cast and crew. (sighs) Right, them too. For the 2016 Audioverse Awards. Thank you so much. The Audioverse Awards is an annual award show celebrating the best in free audio drama. And we're thrilled to be a part of it. We need your help. The nomination period ends on September 30th, and then online voting begins. The first round of voting will be open for two weeks to decide the finalist in each category. We would really appreciate it if you could take some time in the first two weeks of October and vote for me, Randy Cool. Randy? What? Oh, great. And the rest of the... Of of our talented... Of our talented cast and crew. Good, good, good. And me... Randy Cool. Stop talking now. I am stopping talking now. You can vote by going to www.audioverseawards.net. And if you love audio drama like we do, there are a ton of categories and shows nominated. Vote for the ones you love and take a listen to the ones you haven't heard of yet. When you voted, feel free to share that you did and invite others to vote on... Oh, wait. Hold it. I know I can do this. The Facebook or the Twitter. I do it better. Sure. I do. Boys, seriously. Sorry, Sorry, Rhiannon. Rhiannon. Once again, the website for voting is www.audioverseawards.net. And the voting is the first two weeks of October. Thank you so much for listening. And now, back to the show. Rex Riveter, Private Eye. Which is me, Randy Cool. Okay, look. What? I wrote you. Okay, boys, we are done. No, no, no. You've got it all wrong. It's got it. It's and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's got to come from you know down in the uh, down in the and now do it and now. Wait, I, I don't. I, you're you're hogging the mic. You're I'm not hogging the mic. Okay, I'm gonna the tell mic. the end. Wait, you okay. just stepped on my. Foot. I didn't step on your foot. What, that was your foot. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we return to Rex Riveter, Private Eye, in a case of triple indemnity. Carmen sends the gardener away, and we have just a few minutes alone before L.A.'s finest arrive. Neither of us trust the other, but working together seems to be the only thing that might keep us from going downtown in handcuffs. When the first officers show up, I'm still not convinced she won't turn me in. And so that's why we have a safety, ma'am. You should always check to see if the gun is loaded before... Hold it right there, mister. Drop the gun. Oh, Hello, officer. You heard him! Drop it! All right. Don't get your knickers in a twist. Set the gun down on the coffee table real slow, mister. That's right. Now move up against the wall. Luca comes back inside just in time for... And you, in the kitchen, come out here real slow. Vieni in salotto, Luca. Ma fallo lentamente. Questi americani son pazzi con le pistole. Ma non dovremmo lasciare qui arrestiano questo uomo. Se la portano via, potremo uscire di qua. What are you saying? Cerca di fare quello che ti dico io, Luca, e andrò tutto bene. What is that, French? Speak English. It's Italian. She's telling him to come in, just like you asked, officer. Quiet, everybody! Luca moves into the living room with the rest of us, and the two cops start asking questions. Before too long, we're joined by a couple more flatfoots, and then a detective. They separate us and start grilling us real good. I get raked over by the two that arrived here first. Your license plates were called in about an hour ago from a unit over on Franklin. What were you doing over there? Like I said already, Mr. Scarlatti owned a curio shop on the corner there. I was looking to partner up with him. When I found out what happened to him, I came over to offer my condolences to his widow. When I got to the door, I heard a gunshot. I entered the residence and found Mrs. Scarlatti holding the gun. Apparently, it went off on accident. That's pretty flimsy, Riveter. 
asked Mrs. Scalati. We did. You know what she said? She said you busted in here trying to <laughs> rob her. You know, for a cop, you're a terrible liar. All right, smart guy. <laughs> Let's hear another wisecrack. I'm beginning to wonder which is worse, getting beat up by Anthony Salerno's friends or the cops. I can hear the conversation with Luca escalating in the other room. Apparently, nobody on the force speaks Italian. That works in my favor because I'm not certain the gardener is going along with the story. Pretty soon, the detective joins us in the kitchen. <sighs> Riveter. I seem to remember that name. You're Captain Burke's little friend, ain't you? Captain? Yeah, didn't you hear? Burke is racking up quite a name for himself lately. Just in the last few days, he solved three cases, one of them over at the university. Yeah, I think I heard something about that. You guys don't waste any time, though. He made Captain? Well, not quite yet. But some of the boys in Homicide have started treating him like he has. I see. Look, Riveter, I've read the reports... Burke seems to think you're a straight shooter. I wish he wouldn't gush like that. It's embarrassing. Me? I'm not so sure. But since I don't want to be on Burke's bad side, and other than a hole in the fireplace, there don't seem to be any harm done, we're going to let this one go. What? We have probable cause to at least hold him downtown, Detective. Look, this ain't Boyle Heights, officer. It's Bel Air. These good folks pay their taxes for us to protect them from the boogeyman. They don't want us interfering with their pity squabbles. Nobody's pressing charges against nobody, so let it go. Mrs. Scalati in there has just uh, lost her husband, and she's Italian. She's apt to be a mite... Mm, emotional. Well, this is bull! Stow it, officer! Otherwise, I might have to write something down. I do got some advice for you, though, Riveter. Keep your nose clean. You ain't making many friends on the force. Thanks for the tip. All right, boys. Let's clear out. We don't want the neighbors to think anything is going on here. Their property values might drop. Yeah, so what if they do? So then they start writing letters to the mayor, and he has to start conversating with the chief. The cops disappear faster than a mid-July fog. Carmen is in the living room. She's visibly shaken. But she's a good kid. She's stuck with the story. When she comes into the kitchen, even with the doors wide open, the temperature seems to rise 10 degrees. Are you all right? Why don't we start again, Mrs. Scalati? I think you should leave, Signor Riveter. Well, at least you're calling me by my name. I heard the policeman say it. I heard them say a lot of things. What is a private dick, Signor Riveter? I really don't like that term. It's just... Did you even know my husband? To be honest with you, no. I never met him. Then why are you here? I'm a private investigator, Mrs. Scalati. I was hired to look into your husband's death. Hired? Hired by who? Transmutual Insurance. The company your husband took out his policy with. So much for keeping things quiet. And how do you know Signor Salerno? The guy that was at your front door? He was involved in a job I worked a few days ago. Another insurance case? No, a missing person. How is he involved with this? He's representing one of the parties interested in buying Vincenzo's shop. Curious, sir. I'm curious, sir. Vincenzo told me about him the day before he died. He said Signor Salerno was trying to get him to sell his store. But you never really answered my question, Mr. Riveter. Why are you here? Is there a problem with my husband's insurance? Not necessarily, Mrs. Scalati. Just routine. Carmen, uh, please... And may I call you Rex? Sure. Call me whatever you'd like. Maybe it's just my imagination. But once she finds out I'm not trying to kill her or buy her shop, Mrs. Scalati seems to relax. Women are funny. All right. Rex, why don't we have the coffee now? It seems we have a lot to talk about. All right. In all of the trouble I've forgotten... How do you like your coffee? Steaming hot and on the kitchen table. Carmen brings in a tray with coffee, cups, and some finger sandwiches into the living room. She pours for both of us and then sits down close to me on the sofa. Real close. I'm sorry about what I said earlier. About not trusting me? No, about the coffee cake. I don't have any. I don't even know how to make it. 
Well, that's all right. I'm a horrible cook. Maybe I am the one that shouldn't be trusted. Are you dangerous? My husband used to think so. My late husband. Carmen starts off with some small talk, something to pass a little time. She's about to dig deep into her life with Vincent. I can tell there's more to it than fulfilling the American dream. People are funny. The bigger their secret, the more they want to share it. The more they want to share it, the sooner they spill the beans. So I leave a little slack in my line and let her nibble for a while. When she's ready, she starts talking. I grew up in a tiny villa south of Milan in Italy. I was the youngest of four daughters and my parents were very poor. By the time I was of marrying age, what few men that were left after the war in my little village were already spoken for. So my father made a deal with a man he knew whose nephew lived here in America. A week later, I was sent here to meet my betrothed. My 17th birthday found me somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, surrounded by strangers, completely alone. Signor Riveter. Rex. Rex. I cannot tell you how terrifying it is to travel across the ocean to meet and marry a man you have never viewed before. I had taken ill during the passage, and when I arrived in New York, I could barely make it off the ship. I was so weak. Vincenzo was a very portly man, and I was so frail from travel sickness, I was certain that he would send me back home immediately, or worse, he would leave me in this strange land to fend for myself. I had no one here, and was completely at his mercy. But he showed kindness. He carried me down the gangplank himself. He took me to the home of his parents, and over the next several weeks he nursed me back to health by himself. He wouldn't let anyone else lift a finger to help me. At first I thought it was because he was ashamed of my looks. He told me later it was because he didn't ever want to be away from me. He was a kind and gentle man. He was ten years older than me, but that didn't matter to either of us. We fell in love. Not a storybook love. Something real. Do you know what that is like? I didn't bother answering. Whatever she felt for her husband didn't need anyone else's approval. She was a good girl, and she had left her old family, half a world away, for a new one. The polizia in New York were always looking to make problems for the Italians. Vincenzo got into a little trouble with the law, so we moved out here to Los Angeles. He had a friend, Alberto, who took us in, and Vincenzo started working for this man. He made some new friends, and pretty soon we moved from a tiny apartment we shared with Alberto to our own one-bedroom. Then came a promotion for Vincenzo and a nice car, then some new clothes, then another promotion and another move. Vincenzo began to work longer hours. He would come home later and later, or not come home at all. We began to grow apart. I knew he was not always working. I don't mean to be indelicate, Mrs. Scalati, but if he wasn't working... There were other women, I suppose. He denied it. He tried to keep it from me, but I knew. A woman knows. So why didn't you leave? And go where, Signor Riviter? Back home to my parents. My father had sold me, or might as well have. If I went home, my father would have to pay back the money for my passage and all the costs I incurred. I had no family in America, other than my husband and few friends. No, this was my home. This is where I belonged. I'm sorry, Mrs. Galati. You said he worked a lot. What kind of business was your husband in? Vincenzo? I don't know exactly. I never asked him about his business. I think he worked in sales, but I never really knew what it was he sold. Sometimes it was watches, sometimes suits. One time he brought home three cases of meat. We had to make room for it in our icebox and then go out and buy. Well, none of that matters now. So how did he get into curios? Vincenzo won that store from a man in a game of poker. Must have been pretty high stakes. He was always doing things like that. He was a man that enjoyed the risk, living by his wits. 
That is the phrase. By his wits. Yeah, that's the phrase. Ours was a love story, Senor Riveter, just not a fairy tale. Carmen is interrupted by the help. He looks from her to me, and something that resembles jealousy passes through him. Quick, but unmistakable. Pero ci ancora qui. Sto cercando di scoprire quello che sa. Beh, esbarazzi di lui rapidamente. Non mi piace di verlo seduto accanto a te, fiolino mio. Non preoccuparti, amor mio. Lui è qui solo. Per farci ottenere i soldi rapidamente e andarcene. I'm sorry, he was asking what I do about the doors. Oh, that's all right. I won't take up any more of your time. I do have one more question, though. What do you know about the shooting? Uh, not much, really. The police came to my door that night and told me he had been shot. It was very messy. They needed me to identify his body. Please, I am sorry. I do not mean to be inhospitable, but I would like to be alone now. I guess I am not quite over my husband's tragedy. I hope you understand. Oh, sure, I understand. Don't worry. I'll see myself out. Thank you, Rex. Uh, please, is there anything else I can do to speed up the process? It shouldn't be more than a couple of days. Tell me something. If you get the money, what will you do? If, Mr. Riveter? Is there something keeping the insurance company from paying? You never know with these kind of things, but I'll make my report soon. Oh, I see. I would leave Los Angeles, leave America. There's nothing for me here anymore. Goodbye, Rex. And thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Scalati. As I drive back to my office, two things are bothering me. One, there is something more going on between the widow Scalati and that gardener. The way he looked at her was more than just an overprotective groundskeeper. And I swear I heard him call her Fiore. It's one of the only words I picked up in my time in Italy during the war. It means flower. The other thing that's nagging at me is the brown sedan tailing me was the same one I'd seen on my way over to the Scalati place. He's far enough back, with his hat pulled down low and the sun glinting off his hood. I can't get a look at his mug. But it's the same car. I'll bet my life on it. Tonight's episode of Rex Riveter Private Eye starred Randy Cool and Rhiannon McAfee and featured Rachel Bishop, Charlie Miller, Steve Murdoch, James Steinberg, and Dave Rivas. It was written by Greg McAfee and was transcribed in San Diego, California. It was produced by Downstairs Entertainment with recording, sound, and editing by Davy Boy Productions. The Rex Riveter theme, Nightmare, by the Artie Shaw Orchestra, is used by permission of Music Sales Corp. Rex Riveter is directed by Rhiannon McAfee with vocal, sound, and technical direction by Dave Rivas. And if you enjoyed tonight's episode, please find us on the internet at www.dsentertain.com or on the Facebook or the Twitter. Tonight's episode of Rex Riveter Private Detective is brought to you in part by Davy Boy Productions. For sound design, private voiceover workshops, or to consult with voiceover recording artist Dave Rivas about your project, visit www.davyboyproductions.com. And be sure to join us next Monday night, same time and place for Rex Riveter Private Eye in Part 4 of A Case of Triple Indemnity. For Downstairs Entertainment, this is Greg McAfee speaking. Okay, wait, wait, wait. It's Rex Riveter, Private Eye. Who's who's the voice of Rex Riveter? Um, right. <laughs> Old Man River. <laughs> I love you, <laughs>